Everyone, uh, great. Uh, great to see everyone. This week, we have the privilege of studying off Torah for Parshat Mik uh, Vaigash, uh, which comes from Ezekiel 37. Um, I uh, still do not have the Son Chumash. I got up this morning remembering I should bring one home from Shul, and I forgot to. What page is on in the Son Chumash? 1144. 1144. Thank you so much. Um, so let us dive right in. This is, we have the privilege of studying uh, from Yechaskel, from Ezekiel. If you recall, what do we know about Yechaskel? What do we remember about Yechaskel? He was prophesying in Bavel. He's prophesying from Bavel, um, or at least partly. Um, he is at the end of the second, I'm sorry, at the end of the first temple. Um, and in particular, he is, uh, you know, obviously part of the later prophets, part of the of Nivim. So we would expect more uh, prophecy and not prose. This is what we get. Um, not story, but prophecy. Um, yeah, the book of Yechazkel is comprised as, as almost the bridge between the haunting prophecies of Jeremiah and the uh, more salvation-based prophecies of Yeshayahu, of Isaiah. Um, and uh, we get we get uh, Yechaskel, Yechaskel, the first half, let's say until chapter 25, 24, deals with dire prophecies relating to the religious and the moral decay of the last kingdom of Yehuda, um, or of the kingdom of Yehuda, the end of the first Jewish commonwealth. Um, if you recall already, the 10 northern tribes are already uh, exiled. They are exiled about 150 years, 200 years before the destruction of the set of the first temple. Um, and this is during the final days of the last days of Tzikiyahu. Um, who is going to be the end of the site of the first temple? Um, in the middle, after the first, let's say, 25 chapters, we have different prophecies to the nations, right? To uh, Edom, to Tyre, to uh, Moab, to Ammon, to, to Egypt, um, all sort of uh, forecasting their mis misfortune for their rejoicing, assisting, breaking promises in the destruction of the first temple. Um, chapter 34, at the moment of calamity, as things begin to shift, we begin to get some prophecies about rebuilding the temple. Chapter 37, which is our chapter, <laughs> we, start middle, thank you. we start in the middle at chapter 15, but the first 15 chapter, the fifth, first 15 verses is the famous dry bones um, prophecy. Um, that uh, the bones of that are have been dried, that are scattered, probably either allusion to those that are being exiled, or even to the ten northern tribes that are are gone, um, will one day uh, be resurrected, be uh, be collected, continue to rejoice and join in um, on a national redemption. Um, and this is miraculous. It's, it's it's important for us to think about. Jews had never existed in exile successfully at the destruction of the first temple. This idea that you can exist as a Jew during destruction, during exile, was countercultural. It was against sort of the prevailing wisdom of the way gods worked in those days. And historically, the northern tribes were not able to set up communities that sustained their religious identity, right? We don't have the northern tribes anymore, for whatever reason, right? They are not able to sustain themselves. There's no egg community in exile when the Northern Kingdom gets exiled. It is totally unique, totally miraculous, totally innovative that the Jewish community is able to replicate and hold on to their Jewish identity after the destruction of the first temple. I, part of Ezekiel, Yechezkel's message to the people is this idea, right? This is, that's part of his message. It's where we have the idea that the Beit HaMikdash, I'm sorry, that the Beit Knesset, the Shul, is a Mikdash Ma'at, is a miniature temple, 
right? And that sort of becomes a focal point of existence in exile. All of that is predicated in the revolutionary philosophy of Yechesko, right? And that's sort of, our Haftor is relatively straightforward, but part of that is because we enjoy the uh, historical look to recognize that if that was possible. But even with all the trials and tribulations, assimilation that exile brings the Jewish people, the fact that there is still people studying Torah, keeping the mitzvot, part of the tradition, was novel and revolutionary to the Jews who were experiencing the first exile of Egypt. I'm sorry, of uh, the temple. So that's number one. We, we get our Haftorah, and our Haftorah, as we'll read, we'll read together quickly. Um, our Haftorah is a very straightforward prophecy, and it, in, and it um, uh, illuminates on many different levels. God spoke to me saying, O new, O mortal, right? We've talked about this moniker many times, Ben Adam. Now that is Ezekiel's, Yechezkel's famous nickname. Um, we, we've talked in the past about why that is. What does Ben Adam stand for? It sort of is degrading O mortal person. Um, Yechezkel has these very deep visions into the inner workings of heaven. And sort of the counterbalance of that is that he's constantly reminded that he is only mortal, not to be confused that he is an angel. Um, and it sort of is the balance, the humility of Yechezkel seeing these unbelievable images of God's workings, and at the same time, this sort of refrain, oh, mortal man, you know, remember your place. You're just a man. You're just a mortal. You're just a finite being. Um, but uh, if I dropped you anywhere in Tanakh, anywhere in the Bible, and you saw the term, oh, ben adam, bata ben adam, and you, oh, mortal man, you'll know right away where to find it. It is Yechezkel. Uh, write on it, so take in your hand a stick and write on it a plank and write on it uh, for it for of uh, Judah and of the of the of Israel, the children of Israel. And take another stick and write on it for Yosef, eight Ephraim. Uh, the tree of Ephraim, Lachobe Yisrael, Averav, for for Ephraim and for and Yo Joseph and everyone together. And this is a clear allusion to the north and southern kingdom. Ephraim is the uh, the progenitor of the northern kingdoms. They all the kings of the northern kingdom. They come from Ephraim, and uh, and Yosef obviously, and uh, obviously Yuda is representative of the southern kingdom of the kingdom of Judah. That the Kurov Otam Echa the Kurov Otam and bring them together verse 17 Echa al Khad one to another um Lacha uh one to another Laits Echa Lacha Laits Achad the Ayu La Khadim Biadecha. They should be going together as one in your hand. Right? This image is very uh transparent. You're renewing, you're connecting, you're re uh, unifying the Jewish people. When the people see you do this and they ask, they more, hello, tagid lanu ma ela lacha. And this is basically a show. Isaiah is, I'm sorry, Ezekiel is being told, go and write a big sign on one and a big sign on the other, Yehuda and Yisrael and, and uh, Yosef, and bring them together in your hands and walk in the streets. People would ask, what is this symbol? What is this sign? What is this? Theatrical gesture that you're trying to convey. Zaber Alehem say to them, Koamar, present this this uh this prophecy, Hashem, so says God, Yosef, I'm going to take the northern kingdom, the Yosef, the kings of the northern kingdom, and all the tribes that are exiled with them, all the tribes of Israel, ten tribes, ten tribes. And Otam uh uh I'll, um, and I'm going to put them together uh, to, on Eit Yehuda with Eit Yehuda with the Southern Kingdom. Vasitim leEitz Echad Vayu Echad Biati, and I'll make them one. I will recast the Jewish people into one fertile plant, one tree of life. Vayu Atzavim Hashem Kavu Aleim Biatcha Leinam, and you should hold before their eyes the sticks which you are inscribed. 
right? God is given um, not just the prophecy here, but the method, the means, the drama, the prop for the sermon as well. And say to them, so says Hashem, I'm going to bring back all the exiled northern Israelites. And I'm going to bring them, I'll bring them back to their land. And I will make to them, verse 22, to one unified nation in the land, Yisrael, and the kingdom of Israel. And you might be wondering, well, how is this going to work? What's this new entity going to look like? There'll be one king, um, uh, the Jewish people won't be divided into two nations. They won't be divided into two uh, kingdoms anymore. And they won't defile themselves with the idolatries, the chope and all of their sins. I will save them from all in their settlements. I'll clean, cleanse them. Um, I, this is sort of reforging the Sinai I, I prophecy. Will be to God as a nation. The God will be to us as a as a, as as a God. And what's the, the kicker here? Vadi David Melach. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, verse 25. Vadi David and my king and my servant David, the house of David, the divinic line, Melach um, Aleham will, will, will uh, rule over them. There'll be one shepherd for all of them, meaning they won't be split into two kingdoms. Will be Mishpatai. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, they will follow my rules and uh, keep my laws and do them and then they'll dwell on Jacob's land meaning the moment before the schism between the different brothers um, your forefathers sat on them, their children, and their children's children, on Olam forever. And David will be the ruler, the leader, the prince for them. It's not just a, a vision of bringing everyone together, but we're sort of solving the political problem because there's no longer going to be strength. We know who the king's going to be. It's going to be the Davidic line. The Karate line breach Shalom. I'm going to make for them a brief, a covenant of peace, brief olam, an everlasting peace. Yeah, Otam will be with them. I will uh, uh, establish them and put them and uh, uh, multiply them. They'll have lots of people. And I'll put my um, my my temple in there in them forever, right? Where is the temple, by the way? Where was the temple? Not a trick question. Jerusalem, right? And where? What what kingdom does that represent? Judah. Judah. That's cute. In the next verse. Vahaya mishkani alehem and my presence. But what's the word we're using over here? Mishkan, right? Where was the mishkan in? In the desert. Yeah, I know, but before they built the temple, whose portion was? It was in the northern kingdom, right? You, so you have over here this idea of sort of bringing both of them together and this, these illustrations. I'll be for them a God. They'll be for me for a nation. Not just this won't be internal peace, but external peace. All the nations will know. And you will know that, uh, and everyone will know that I am the sanctuary that sanctifies the people because my my sanctuary, my mikdash, or I, or I'm the one who's sanctifying the people is God uh, forever. And about right, so the story is actually pretty straightforward. We get what the illusion is, right? We understand this is about bringing. This is a few. This is a redemptive 
allusion to the future. It's about bringing back the northern and southern tribes here. It's about recognizing there'll be a renewed religious enterprise, a renewed um, focus on, uh, it's not just uh, territorial renewal and national renewal, but we hear about cleansing them from sins, a new leadership of David. Um, and uh, and 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 go from there. Um, um, all right, so that's part one. One of the interesting ideas is this metaphor of the two trees that you sort of put together. You know, that's one thing we sort of described as a prop. But others suggest not like a prop, but if you're familiar with the laws or with the processes of grafting trees, right, you could take a, a weak tree and sort of graft it and sort of cross pollinate for different traits. So if you think about it from that perspective, I'm sort of taking the dried uh, tree that is de desiccated, that is the Northern Kingdom and grafting it onto the strong root of the Southern Kingdom and making one tree, it's also a way of understanding the metaphor of this prophecy um, as well. Um, are you with me so far? Yeah, but Rabbi, just uh, for in terms of the grammar, um, the word, I mean, using, they're translating here the word ace as wooden tablet in the stone edition. Does it actually have that connotation in this context? Um, does it have it? I mean, clear. there's some commentaries that read it that way. Um, where did they get that from? Probably because he talked about writing on them. Yeah, I was thinking that too, because there's writing. Um, <laughs> so three. Well, when you say paper plates in Hebrew, it's like plates of trees or something. So. No, it definitely can mean that. The eights meaning in that sense wood. Piece of like a piece of wood. Yeah, and definitely could mean a piece of wood. I'm just wondering why that would be that way. Normally, you would say like cleates or something like that. Um, like some note of that before. Um, see what the redact says. It might be a question of like, what is this act of bringing them together, right? If you have the wooden planks, then you can bring them together. If you have two branches, like what exactly is going on? They could grow together. You plant two, two sprigs in the ground and they'll tend to grow together as a single. Ah, the Targum, so the Redox says, Says the Ritak, these two things will be in your hands, will be one. That the Jewish people will be one. We all got that. My father used, uh, used to teach. This is the Ritak. Um, that there should be take two branches, and they actually made them into one tree, the Nis, in a miracle. Ubi Yonatan Targum in the Targum Yonatan, it's the whole age of a Parsha Zoo and all the trees in this situation, in this, in this area. Um, what does he say? He says he calls them Lucha, Lucha, plank, like a Luach, like a, like a, like a, like the Lucho. Between you, I eat San Targum Licha, Shebe Pasuk
Yeah, so it seems like this comes from the Targum Yonatan. Um, why is that the case? Let's see what he says, Targum Yonatan. Again, it repeats it. Yeah, so he says it's it's wood. What's the? What, I'm not sure. I like the image much more of the tree of the of the of connecting the tree to one another. So I'm 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 going to go with the more agricultural metaphor. Um, I, um, I also think it's I, I don't think I think there are other Hebrew words for that. It might be a luach eitz. Right, yes. a plank of wood. Um, so I don't know what the what the reason is for that, but it's a good question. I'm glad you raised it. Um, I think we talked about that. Now that it's sort of coming back to me, I think we might have talked about that in the past. That what this was, but I'm going to go with this uh, with this reading for this. I think the other interesting piece to sort of talk about also is obviously its impact on our parsha. Right, the impact on our parsha is the reunification of the people. But there are ways, you know, the girls are watching uh, Daniel Tiger. Um, so he has this song, what's different and what's the same, right? And the same thing is sort of for us to think about here, what's different, what's the same? Obviously there's a reunification, there's a bringing together. But um, what, it, it's, it's sort of interesting to see what's different, right? Who's the leader in our Torah portion? Obviously Judah, but who's ultimately like has all the power? Joseph. 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 And, and, and sort of what's his coalition? How many people are sort of with him tribes-wise? Three plus his wife. Meaning his family, his immediate family, that's it. But none of the other tribes. Judah is the leader, is but subservient to that, and he represents all the tribes. Think about the case of the end of the second temple, end of the first temple we were talking about. You have Yosef representative of the leadership of all the tribes all the tribes and you have judah with a minority of tribes right shimon Binyamin, judah being the leader over everyone right sort of envisioned here right it's interesting to sort of see the um the restoration but also the flip of that um um and that becomes a major theme here for us to sort of think about when it comes to uh, the Haftorah. Um, right, but that, also another parallel there was that in our Parsha, Joseph is, is in, in, in essence returning from an exile. Joseph is returning from an exile. I mean, he was essentially exiled by his brothers to... Right, but, but where's the final destination that they're ending up in? They're going to end, well, in terms of, of being the ex, okay, let me rephrase it then. He's sort of been exiled from his family. Yeah, totally, of course. Okay. Right, right, but I'm saying from a geographic location, where do they end up? They stay in, in Egypt. Right, so Joseph is sort of, they're all returning to him. I think there's also a major difference here between like the full redemption that we're talking about, that the Haftar is talking about, clearly has a role. It's not just bringing back the people. We hear over and over again. Um, uh, I'm going to bring them the Heveti Otam El Admatam. I will bring them to their land, verse 21. Um, and they won't be two, two kingdoms in their land, verse 22. Verse 23, God will purify that in their land. Verse 24, um, no land. Verse 25, and I'll bring them back to their land. That I gave back to their land. And they're going to dwell there where their forefathers dwelled. Um, and verse 26, 27, God's presence will be, God's shina, which is associated with Israel, will be there. Everyone will know that the Jewish people are God's people. Why? Because God dwells with them in their land, in God's land forever. So there's a major emphasis at the second half of the Torah about the location of this redemption, which is also a, a point of departure from our, our, our half Torah. Um, um, the other main point that I, I, I think 
sometimes when we read this Haftorah, we don't appreciate as much is the role where division leads to the exile, right? We think we a lot of times the prophets talk about um, how the sins lead to exile, but the division that, that the sins led to also, the, the slick kingdom also lived, leads to a huge factor for exile, meaning, right? If you're familiar with the works of Dibre Yamin with Chronicles or other places, um, the divisiveness, the split between the two kingdoms brings about, um, you know, almost, almost a half a million deaths for the Jewish people. Um, the civil war that that, that, that represents. Um, they, they, you know, as a result of the split, the two kingdoms are obviously smaller. Obviously their resources are split and therefore they're weaker. Their borders are reduced. They become essentially satellite nations for foreign powers because they grew and they and, and they didn't have the, the, the power to be their own sort of he local hegemony. Um, and so part of this process of the rebuilding, we hear a lot about, right? And this is a famous uh, line from Yishayahu, um, that Ephraim won't be jealous of Yehuda, Ephraim will be Yehuda, and Yehuda will not bear enmity towards Ephraim. All of these are sort of this idea that one of the causes for the precarious state of the Jewish people in, at that time period is because of the split. Um, and again, obviously that tracks nicely with our Torah because the Torah also is all about, I'm sorry, the, I'm sorry, the Torah tracks very nicely with our Parsha because the Parsha is all about the, the split and that split leads to real challenge within the Jewish people. And that idea of that notion of the lack of unity being a source, an Achilles heel for the people, we already know is very much on the minds of the people who are choosing the Haftorahs based on what we saw with Parshas Vayeshev, um, that Haftorah not having any words of consolation, right? This theme of getting over the internal strife and that being a uh, essential step to, to securing redemption um, is something that's not lost in this Haftorah as well. And that's, that's another sort of difference between the partial that plays out and the Haftorah that plays out. So just to finish this point, right? What's different, what's the same? You have Yehuda being the leader in our Haftorah. You have Yehuda being the leader of a minority group, being the leader, I'm not getting into like current politics, but the idea that someone could be the leader of Israel and maybe only have three other parties that work with him, whereas you have a much larger party that wasn't the leadership, which is, you know, it's just interesting to sort of see how some of these prophecies play in to some of the rhetoric that exists in Israeli politics today. Um, uh, bringing, bringing people back to the land of Israel, which is an essential part of this reunification. It's not just bringing the Jewish people together, but using the land of Israel to be the fertile soil for this tree to go, grow. Which is why, again, I think this eighth line is, is tree and branch and not like process wood plank because there's so much of this land metaphor that like you would almost lose the valence of the soil connotation that is the fertile ground for this tree to grow, which seems to be part of the extended metaphor that Isaiah, that uh, Yechaskel, Ezekiel is trying to bring here. Um, this idea that David plays this central role is obviously really important. Um, um, this ro'eh achad, there'll be a single, a single uh, uh, leader, right? Just as an aside, right? How does everyone, you know, we, we spent eight days singing Ma'usor, right? How does Ma'usor end? I don't remember. Yar chalano Yeshua, because the time for redemption is, has been so long. Vain kates limei ara'ah. There's no end to the time of uh, evil. Uh, push back Edom in the in the shadow of the red one. Hakim Hakim Lanu established for us. Some people say Roe Shiva, the shepherd, of, the one shepherd of seven, or Hakim Lanu Roim Shiva, seven shepherds, right? So this, if you take, so who. There's a whole question of what this really means, right? Are you familiar with the way? How did, do you remember how it ends? 
right? Hakim Lanu has an end. When you sing it last this past week. Well, that's the first stanza. So there are two ways. Either it means Ro'esh Shiva, the shepherd of seven, or Ro'im Shiva, the seven shepherds, right? So if it's, if it's the, the, the shepherd that is seven, over the seven, so this might be a reference to this, this prophecy as well. Ro'echad, there's a single shepherd that will oversee the reunification of the Jewish people. It's a reference to our, our Haftorah. Where is the seven, what, what's the seven things that they have to uh, shepherd over? Um, so it's, it either is the, different, the seven different words that sort of get written on these different planks or these different trees. That's one way I saw it. Or probably more accurately, it's a reference also to the prophecy of Isaiah, that Isaiah says in the Messianic era that the sheep will lie with the lion and the lamb will graze with the bear, right? Everyone remember that? Sounds familiar? So yeah. there's animals in that, uh, in that prophecy. So the shepherd of seven is referring to that also. Um, what are the seven shepherds? If that's the way the liturgy is supposed to be, that's a conversation for Hanukkah. We'll have to wait till next year to discuss. But if that might be part of a, a, a subtle anti-Christian polemic that is embedded into the last stanza of uh, Maosur, um, meaning the Christians believe that there's one salvation that will come in one fell swoop. We don't believe that. There are seven shepherds. There are seven different sort of waypoints on the way to Messiah. Um, not just one. Obviously, that how you deal with our prophecy is a separate question. Um, that's a mouse sore point. Um, all right. So the Abtor is pretty straightforward, right? And the connection to our parsha is eminently clear. But what's beneath this is layers and layers of important meaning um, in terms of what this Abtor means for us, for the Jewish people at that time, and for Jewish history and the Jewish future. So we'll stop here. If anyone has any questions, happy to talk. Okay, thank you, Ralph. Great. Awesome. Have a great day, everyone. Okay, you too. Thank you.